Hello and welcome to episode 390 of the video show. Today we're joined by Michael Coltham from Black Lab Music. So I met Michael at an online networking event um, and we were speaking afterwards about um, music and how I use music as um, a video producer. Um, and Michael creates his own music from scratch. And this is something I've never done. I usually get my music from um, royalty free sites where I pay a yearly pa uh, package and I can download what I want. But Michael works in a way that he looks at the footage and he talks to the video producer or the filmmaker and he creates music specifically for that. And I think that's really quite a powerful way of doing that because you can create music that's specifically for that video or specifically for that company. Um, are specifically for that film that fits in perfectly whereas if you sort of download it from a website it's kind of like eh, that'll do that's good enough that's close enough so if you want to really nail the music really nail the emotion that's what you need to do you need to talk to someone like Michael so I initially wanted to talk to Michael about um, how AI is changing how this music is made changing music in general but the conversation sort of went away from there a, a, a little bit as well. So there's lots about how he uses music, how he uses AI, how he produces the music and how that works. It's a fascinating conversation. Um, I really do hope you enjoy it. Um, here it is. Let's just, less of me talking. Let's get on with the episode. Well, I am Michael from Black Lab Music and I am the emotional music guy. I compose emotion uh, through the medium of music for videographers, videographers, which I can never say, and filmmakers uh, to help them connect with their audience. So providing bespoke composition for everything and anything, be that a corporate video, be that for a fictional film, be that for whatever it may be, just anything where someone wants to elevate that um, story, the storytelling above what you get out of library music, um, I compose something bespoke for it, but package it in a library music sort of way. So it's nice and simply packaged, but videographers get bespoke composing uh, for it. So yeah, that's what I do. How does the process work? Uh, like, so from when they get in touch with you, yeah. how does that process work? I'd be really interested to know, because I've, I've, you know, I'm somebody that up until now has only used like library music and yeah, I yeah. subscribe to something. Uh, yes. I won't mention it because we're talking about you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, how does that process work? My question. Uh, basically, yeah, videographers, filmmakers contact me um, uh, either with an, an idea or with the complete opposite end of the spectrum with some locked video um, that they, they've shot and they can either not make library music work for it or that it's just they can't find the right thing um, to, to make it work. So basically I start off with what I call a creative ignition session where we just sit and have a chat about what is the purpose behind it? What's the emotion? What's the narrative? Who are we connecting to? What are we trying to achieve? What's the outcome? What's the emotional beat of this thing uh, that we're after? What sort of styles and genres? And just basically just ignite that creativity from a music perspective. Um, I then go away and create what I call the pencil sketch of the Mona Lisa. So I go and do a draft bit of music which captures the conversation that we've had in that creative ignition session, send that back to the, to the videographer and go, is this what you meant, roughly? Um, and we have a bit of backwards and forwards where we define sort of the style and the genre and the B and the instrumentation and just sort of craft a pencil sketch of what the music should be, how it should move, making sure it hits the right hit points, the emotional intent, that sort of thing. Um, and then once we've agreed that, I then go and paint the Mona Lisa based on that pencil sketch. So I go and do the full composition, um, sort of have a mid-flight review, send it off to back to the videographer and go, this is what we've got. Does that feel right? Yes, it does. Great. I'll carry on. Um, and then once I've uh, sort of composed and produced the whole thing, I'll do a, a rough mix of it, send it back to the videographer, either synced to the video or just the audio, depending on what they want. So I can send it back directly. You can see the, the final thing um, as it plays to the video. And then when you're happy with that, um, I then mix it and master it to broadcast standards and send you 
the final audio in WAV or MP3, whatever format you want, with a two pop or without a two pop, however you want to sync it into your video. And then as the videographer, you can just line up that music directly to your cut. Job done. Feel free to not answer this or to be as vague as you possibly uh, want to yeah. be. But like, what what kind of prices are you talking about? Because like, when I think, oh, like, like yeah, yeah. I've made a short film, I'm gonna, I've got a guy who's going to make all the music for it. In my head, it's like, fucking hell, that's going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> um, what, well, what kind of what's price a lot, are you What's a lot about? of money in your head? I'm thinking like tens of thousands. Uh, yeah, we're nowhere near that. We're nowhere near that okay. um, at all. In that, um, I'm just I, thinking I, about the amount of work that's going into that. Yeah, no, it, it's 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 not tens of thousands in the slightest. It all depends on on what you're using that video for. Um, ultimately, licensing, as you know, in music is always complex. If you pr plan to broadcast it across networked american tv at prime time uh, for everything else obviously that is a huge license uh, as any other bit of music would would be if you're doing a bit yeah, of corporate oh, yeah. video you know designed for website and explain a video to go on there about pages to who they are and a little bit of social media stuff um then i do a um what's called my royalty music alternative package um so all the benefits of bespoke composing but packaged as library music so none of the licensing complications for it uh, and that starts at 395 for that's 395 not three pounds 95 i hasten to add <laughs> 395 for the first minute um and then 95 pounds per 30 seconds of bespoke composing afterwards so that first minute gets preloaded with all of the creative ignition the chat and everything else that happens i then go away and compose it um using in-house tools so as you can see you know the the studio that i'm in now i go and uh, compose and produce that uh in here obviously if i have to hire in a bassoon player because you specifically want a bassoon player to play on it then you can pay the cost of the bassoon player as well but you know uh, if i can produce it in-house uh simply put for the first minute of audio it's 395 pounds and for the next every 30 seconds of audio there on after uh it's another 95 pounds on top um and that is then very very simply put you know a three minute video comes in at around uh six seven hundred pounds worth of of uh, uh of cost for a bespoke bit of music that follows all of those emotional beats that specific hit points that everything that you need music to do works perfectly with it it's unique to the it's as unique as the unique story you're telling is how i describe it you know as opposed to the i call it the library music alternative because library music is designed to fit everything to about 50%. I compose library music as well, so I, I can speak from authority on this one. Library music fits everything 50%, but it doesn't fit anything 100%. We design to make it magnolia, to make it reasonably bland, so it fits with as many things as possible, because that's what benefits us, the composers, in creating money out of it. Um, I always say to videographers, you know, You've created this unique story. You've crafted the, the shots, the videos, the scenes. You have done the lighting. You've really put all that effort into creating the visuals. Is your music working as hard as your video? You know, and that's where the bespoke music comes into it, um, in that make the music work as hard because that's where the huge emotional connection is uh, with an audience. You know, I, I tell people how they should feel and then i make them feel it you know your visuals and, and the music delivering that together uniquely you know and, and music plays such a huge part in um like driving that emotion in tv shows and film and or, or videos whatever um i did a video a few years ago about like if you change the music it like totally changes the tones that like it was a video of daleks moving across the screen and it was like the, the dalek music they have in Doctor Who, and it's Oh, scary. And then you change it to like, di, 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 and it's just totally ridiculous. So it's not scary anymore. No, no, there's a classic one doing the rounds at the moment, which is uh, from Harry Potter, where, where Harry Potter meets Voldemort 
for the first time and they are wand to wand uh, sort of thing. And then this beautiful love song comes on uh, and and it is the, the, the cinematography and the love song, you know, absolutely work perfectly together. You know, in the real thing, they're sworn enemies and about to do battle. But this bit of video just makes it, they're just about to start dancing with each other. You know, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I need to find that. That sounds amazing. I'm a yeah. big Harry Potter fan. So. Yeah, totally. Like, I was watching another thing the other day that um, I saw that on Disney Plus, they've changed some of the music on Scrubs um, because of like licensing rules or something. So they showed like the original and it worked perfectly because that was the music it was originally like used in the edit and then they added some like it sounded like some royalty free music they added and it was just like what the f like it totally means something totally different this scene now when you're creating music for something will you be inspired by something you've just like listened to in the last like few weeks or like that day will that come into the music that you create i think we draw inspiration from from many many places and that's why i start with that creative ignition session because it's almost like a reset um, it's almost like, a, okay, so what are we doing on this project? What do we need to deliver for this? What's in the eye of the director, the producer, the videographer, the filmmaker? What's in the eye of their client? Because obviously you make videos for clients. So ultimately, you know, if I was working for, for yourself, Mark, you have a client that you're working to. So where is that outcome? And that creative ignition session can really reset. Because I I'm a an artist in my own right as well as being Black Lab Music and composing music for for video and film, I am Michael Colton the artist and I love neoclassical music um, and I have music released on Spotify and Apple Music under my own name which is my passion stuff. So as a media composer, it's always good to be able to set aside my preferences through that creative ignition session and go, right, so what is it that the that the audience are after? What do we need to deliver for the viewer? What are we trying to focus on here? Um, because what I like to compose might not necessarily be what you, the director, want and what the client wants. What I like is not necessarily what you like. And, and that creative ignition means that we can bounce that around and I'll have ideas, you'll have ideas. And one of the joys of having a, a a composer on board is that you get not just music, but you get that creative collaborator as well. So I can come and bring in suggestions around this is how music could elevate this scene. If it did, if the music did this, it could elevate the scene like that. And that because you're a, a filmmaker as opposed to a musician might not necessarily have considered necessarily how that music this sort of different structure or type or a rising motif or a descending motif can change that emotional feel. I say I spend all of my time dealing with emotions in music and how to create those. And, and that's where that sort of creative ignition comes in to prevent me going, I listened to the Arctic Monkeys just before I came on this call. I'm now going to compose the Arctic Monkeys, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I I think I work similar in video. Like so, with with my own films that I make, like it's very much my own thing. But then when it's for um, like a client, then like I've got to kind of follow their brief and their brand guidelines and everything like that. So like I couldn't just go and put uh, yeah. like my own thing in it. So yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 something that you've really got to capture yourself on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of AI, yeah. I'm seeing a lot of like AI music come out at the moment. So it's like, what if the Beatles sang uh, like some rap song or something like that? Mm. Or I'm seeing like, uh, AI, like Oasis, an album from Oasis, but it's all yeah. AI. So it's like written by AI and performed by AI, but it sounds like Oasis. What are your views on that? And then... Um, I'll ask another question off that. I'm not going to ask that question yet. I'll ask it in a second. Yeah. So what are your views on AI think, music at the moment? I think AI can provide a huge creative accelerator. Um, it can come up with ideas um, and suggestions and things that haven't actually thought of very much along the lines of 
um, as we were talking just now about me and you having a conversation and collaborating together um, and bouncing ideas around. It can give you something that you haven't necessarily thought of. You know, the Beatles singing in the style of Oasis. OK, that could be interesting um, for it. Where I sit with with AI as a whole is that AI in music has been around for years. I use machine learning algorithms um, and production techniques for years that are based around machine learning for you know AI, what have you. And these tools are established in studios. Um, and it's not, I don't find it scary. I find it quite encouraging that actually we're using technology to be able to develop new creativity. The question that I get asked all the time is that, well, who's going to be out of a job as a result? You know, do we need composers anymore? Can't I just type something into a AI and get a bit of music out of it exactly what I want? And and for me, having pondered this for some time in the knowledge that we were coming onto this call, I came to this sort of conclusion, which is, what is the purpose of music? What is the purpose of creating AI generated music? Is it a product or is it a journey? Is it fulfilling a specific need? What is the need of it? Do you just need to fill some background noise or do you need to connect to another person? Do you need it to be something that is tailor made that will uniquely connect you and elevate something? Or do you just need to feel some background noise? And there's two different ends of the spectrum there. Because at the moment, library music is being used a lot of the time to fill background noise. And a lot of that royalty free background noise, corporate video, stick something on in the corporate genre and just feel some background noise. It's not cut to the video. It's not working and everything else. And, you know, People like me have composed music like that in the past. I can tell you now there's no money in it. So, you know, AI taking over that role, it doesn't particularly concern me, if I'm honest. But a lot of people 10, 15 years ago started their career in, in composing music via that route of composing corporate genre royalty free music. Now I think it's very different. And like all technology, I think we have to move with it. So it doesn't really scare me. Used it for a long time. And I can explain some of the things that, that I do that is AI orientated uh, and the like. But it's, I think we're entering an exciting period at the moment. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so my next question was going to be, how, how do you use AI at the moment? But it's interesting to hear about your... Yeah, it's interesting to hear about your view on it overall. The um, I use AI at the moment. There's a, there's a classic bit of of software that's been around for years, made by a, a company called Isotope. Um, Isotope are now part of the Native Instruments family, um, probably one of the biggest global music software brands that there are. Um, they make hardware and software to Native Instruments. Isotope RX is something that. Um, uh, you have, I'm sure, as every videographer listening, filmmaker listening knows Isotope RX. I use it all the time. However, they make things like um, uh, Isotope Ozone uh, for mastering. They make Neutron for mixing. Uh, and they make another one, Nectar. That's it, purely for vocals as well. And these are bits of software where you click Analyze Audio and five seconds later, it comes up with a processing chain. So your gates, your EQs, your compressors, your maximizers, your transient processes, your limiters and, and things based on your audio that you have recorded that you tell it, I want to be in a pop genre or a rock genre or a cinematic genre. And it creates an audio chain that will process your audio 
and put it into the ballpark of where you want to be. It's quick, it takes five seconds, and it's brilliant. Um, there are many, many tracks out there, and I have released music where I've just used Ozone, Ozone 10, and I've had Ozone, I think, from version seven, I've now got Ozone 10 Advanced, and I have mastered many, many songs using Ozone on it. And the new Ozone 10 has got that. I want to, a lot of my music is cinematic, so I select the cinematic preset and it masters my audio to put it into the cinematic feel on it. And some of the EQing is quite dramatic at times, but it sounds cinematic. Go back a few years, I would have had to give that to my mastering engineer who would have done it by hand. Um, and you know, I have a mastering engineer um, that I work with. Hello, Smudge, Progressive Sound. Um, and he does a lot of my high end work for me. But there are some times when I don't need mastering to be high end. I need it to just work and work quickly. And that's where AI comes in. And I give it my audio. And yes, I have to tweak it and I have to change it. But it's quick. And working for music for the media, as I do, working in this field, you've got to be quick. There are short deadlines at times. I had a client contact me yesterday going, Mike, I've got a different video cut. Can I send it over to you? Can you rejig the music? Yeah, absolutely. Not a problem. Worked on it yesterday. Sent him a, 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 a demo. He listened to it last night. By eight o'clock this morning, he had the final cut finished done. You know, and that was three minutes worth of, worth of video yes. in, in a separate composer. You've got to work quick. And AI enables my business to work quick. Is it 100% right? No. Does it make all the decisions? No. Does it get me in the ballpark of where I need to be? Yes, every time. It's, it's similar to how I'm using it at the moment. So I use it for YouTube descriptions. So I use ChatGPT to write YouTube descriptions and then I go through and make adjustments. Um, I use it, I've used it to re-record certain lines of dialogue. So there's one called Eleven Labs that I'll be talking about in another video. Um, where there was some background noise for somebody talking. I tried to get rid of it through like with a, on Adobe, couldn't get rid of it. So I just typed in like those four or five words into this and then cloned their voice uh, and then got them to say it. I've used it three times and it's worked one, It's worked perfectly once and the other two, it was a bit like, mm, sounds a bit weird, but I think it can work really well. Like the more they develop that, the better that will get. See the way that I'm, I'm viewing AI at the moment in that, um, you know, I, I, I will out myself here. I am 51 and I've, and I've been around music for a, for a long, long time. I remember reading um, in the NME, the New Musical Express. I don't even know whether NME is still going. It's probably all online now and you can't even buy it. But it was a, a newspaper for music. And I remember reading an article in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s that said the guitar band is dead. That's it. It's over. There will be no more bands with guitars in it. The 80s was about the synthesizer. The Yamaha DX1 cost £10,000. The Fairlight was £50,000, you know, back in the 1980s. Music instruments, guitar bands were dead, is what this article was saying. Well, I think Fender and Gibson are doing all right still, the last time I checked. Uh, and guitar sales seem to be accelerating. Uh, you know, I have four of them. <laughs> so guitar bands aren't dead. But back in the you know mid 80s, it was declared because of technology that guitar bands were dead. That was it. It was over because of the synthesizer. Well, actually, I'm sitting in front of one now. I have umpteen of them in my computer. I use synthesizers all the time. I play my own live guitars still and blend it all. We seem to be doing all right. And the guitars didn't fade into non into non-existence um, for it. You know, so uh, th there are many examples of this sort of new emerging technology. Um, I remember the, the, the Y2K bug I was thinking of, you know, the millennium bug. If you remember, I don't know whether you remember that one, you know, all the, our computer architecture was based around was two days you know was the, the last two years so on 1st of january 2000 
we were all going to go back to the year zero zero and planes were going to fall out of the sky. Nuclear missiles would would launch themselves and we would go back to the dark ages all because of these two digits, two numbers. Well, I think we survived that one, too. You know, and I kind of look at this with the new technology with AI and thinking it's new. It's emerging. The other example I was thinking of was cloning Dolly the sheep. All of a sudden, you know, we cloned a sheep and we were going to have human clones walking around by now. You know, I'd have 17 different avatars of me doing various things. As far as I know, there's only one of me. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that, because you don't need two of me. Um, you know, so this new technology comes in all the time and it disrupts and it does stuff. But it also challenges and the joy of being human and being creative is that we look at it and go, oh, that's disruptive. Oh, my goodness, that's a bit difficult. How can I use that for my advantage? And I think that is what separates us as creatives, as humans from AI. We go, actually, I can use that and I can make that work for me. I can think creatively about it, whereas AI can replicate what has been before i think you've hit the nail on the head there like it's just about using it as a tool to improve the, your current processes of doing it it's not, not something to be afraid of it's something to look at and think how can i embrace this to make what i do easier or faster or um, do it slightly differently um so i think it's a re yeah i'm glad that you've like we had a little gap between booking this and filming this because we both sort of had a little think about it um and I know a lot of people that I talk to about AI seem to be a bit worried about it and like, oh, I'm going to be re like, my, I won't have a job, it'll blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I think we are both looking at it in terms of it's a potentially like, it's, it's a really good tool depending on how you use it. I've read a lot of artists talk about AI and, and um, I don't know whether you know the artist Nick Cave, um, you know, he, he's very, yeah. uh, you know, He's got a very distinctive look about him. I love Nick Cave's music. Um, and he was, I was reading an article on the, on the BBC News that was saying that it was an article about from Nick Cave. So basically saying he gets sent music all the time from his fans, which is AI generated music in the style of Nick Cave. And his response to that is it's in the style of Nick Cave, but it doesn't have the soul of Nick Cave. Nick Cave's story, his son died, tragic, tragic circumstances. His songwriting comes from that position. It comes from all of his experience, all of his hurt, all of his joy, all of his life experience of the things that he's done and not done. And all of that gets poured into his songwriting on it. It has his soul in it. I could write a song in the style of Nick Cave, but it wouldn't be a Nick Cave song. And I think that's where we are as artists in that, as I said, I compose emotion through the medium of music. I'm the emotional music guy in that I bleed my emotion into my music. Yes, people, AI could generate something, but where is that? Where is the emotional journey? And it's almost coming back to what I said before around what's the purpose of music in that actually the reason that part of the reason that, that I create music is because actually it's part of my journey. It benefits me to do that. I grow in that process. As an artist, I grow in that. It's not about necessarily creating a product, a widget, whatever that is. It's not about creating a nut or a bolt or whatever. It's about the journey that I go on and growth and soul searching and emotional outpouring develops me as a person in doing that, in understanding my emotions and who I am as a person. You know, I journal a lot because it helps me to to process who I am and develop and, and go on that journey. And creating music for the artist is about the journey. You know, it's not necessarily about the destination. It's not necessarily about the end product. It's about 
bleeding your soul into something and creating something that is absolutely brand new, has never been created before, ever. It's not about being in the style of, it's about creating something that is unique. Um, and, and I love how Nick Cave put it, it just doesn't have my soul. And this is where I come back to that, what's the purpose of it? You know, is it just filling background noise? Is it a widget? Is it a nut or a bolt? Or do you need something that really connects emotionally and has got that soul put into it? I will use AI to create something that has soul and emotion because it's part of my journey now, if you know what I mean. I hope that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, I, like when you're, like the way you were talking there, I was like, that's a clip, that's a clip <laughs> for, this, to, for this episode. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's the best way for people to get in touch with you um come find me on on linkedin i do most of my my business networking on linkedin as michael colton or come and visit my website www.blacklabmusic.co.uk drop me an email michael at blacklabmusic.co.uk